uh, I'm going to show you uh, Reframe, which is a, a framework for writing regression tests and uh, reusing them uh, for uh, HPC systems and helps you with uh, automation. So I can use this. Oh, no. OK. So why, why regression testing? So uh, as you might have seen also, or you might also know um, from yesterday's talks, I mean, HPC software, software stack is really, really complex. And there are so many dependencies. There is also non-standard things, and all sorts of things can go wrong. Even if something innocent or an innocent configuration change is made to the system. And the question is, how do we test that in a sustainable way? Uh, lots, of, lots of centers, they do have uh, some ad hoc solutions. And we did as well, which I'm going to present what it looked like. Uh, now, the question is how we can also, the other thing is how, uh, how we reproduce what the users the user experience, which is quite important. It's not just test, testing in an isolated environment or with the settings that uh, makes, makes our life easier. It's how the user is, we should test how the user is going to use the application, the system, and that's quite important. And then as soon as we have some tests, um, it's very important to, uh, it, their maintainability, how we can maintain them. Uh, because if we want to, to build another beast like the scientific applications just for testing them, then it doesn't make any sense and nobody's going to test. And how we could integrate our tests with other automation tools so that, we can, um, so that we can actually test continuously the system or test every change. And even, even when we are developing an application, to do functional tests for the application in a sustainable manner in different systems. So all these questions uh, we had in mind, that's the key motivation uh, behind uh, this framework. Oh, wrong, okay. So we used to have, when I arrived at CCS, um, a regression testing suite, which was uh, um, a bus script based one. And Actually, it wasn't at all maintainable. So the logic of the tests were very tightly coupled to the system details. So, and there was huge code duplication. So uh, you wanted to test, for example, NumD, and you had to um, do the same logic uh, for uh, submitting the jobs or querying the state of the job, uh, replicate across tests. There was a driver main script that was actually picking up the tests loading them and running them, but it wasn't very well designed. And just to give you an understanding, we had a few tests for some applica key applications and some key functionality tests, and all of them amounted to 15K lines of code with lots of code duplication, which was really unmaintainable. Nobody would, um, uh, if you would ask an operations guy, can, can you write a test in this regression sheet? No, no, he said, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, <clears throat> So also to give you an understanding, uh, at some point we wanted to move from uh, AP Run, the Cray uh, parallel launcher, job launcher, to Native Slurm. And this took us several weeks uh, to debug and port all the changes uh, to, um, to all the tests. And when we discovered the bug, then we had to reproduce this, um, uh, this fix to several files. It was completely unmaintainable. So uh, we came up with, uh, with what we later called the reframe. Back then, it was just a regression testing framework. And the, the key thing was with, that we knew well the problem that we had, so, and we, we set clear targets. So what reframe is, is allows you to write portable HPC regression tests. I know it might be a, a sound. Uh, the, the, the notion of portability in the HPC cannot be in the same sentence, but at least you don't have to be, it, it's portable in the sense you have to do as, as little changes as possible. The other important thing is that uh, we are abstracting away the system interaction details. We want the users or the writers of the test to just focus on the logic of their test. 
not how they obtain a certain, uh, the resources of the system, it's none of their business, it's just request them. Uh, they don't need to know. Uh, or also the details, how to read the files, how to, they just specify in a descriptive way uh, in their test what they want to do. So here is a bit uh, uh, evolution. Uh, we started in March uh, 2016 as a pilot project. And by the August of 2016, I had the first prototype that I gave to some colleagues of my group to just start testing and see if it's feasible, to write some tests. And, uh, and then we decide, OK, we go on. Then at the end of 2016, we had um, a major upgrade in the system. So we moved from decay uh, uh, 20 GPUs to, um, uh, to NVIDIA Pascal uh, architecture. And this has lots of changes. And we managed to put the frame, then we call it pi regression uh, internally, uh, in production to test the system daily. And from then on, uh, in 2017, uh, we introduced a synchronous execution of the test, and we also released publicly the framework. Later on, uh, we moved completely our development in public. We used to have our private internal repo, and then we were doing public releases. So we moved completely the development to GitHub uh, in February 2018. And as well, we published our own checks, our own regression checks, which is as after discussion, I've done some uh, uh, months later with people that it's, it's very, uh, it helped a lot uh, people to um, jump into the project and adopt it. Because they could just take some of uh, the, our tests, they want the Gromax test, for example, they took ours, and we're just doing some small adaptations, and it was running for the system. And that's actually one of the key goals. And actually today, we're not as big as EasyBuild and Spark, but we're gaining some attention. Uh, we have already people and external uh, watching the project and people that are actually using it. We, I'm going to show which centers that I am aware, aware of that either they have it in production uh, or they're experimenting with it. So the design goals uh, were clear just right from the beginning. One is productivity. We wanted to, it, we want to be easy to write tests. When a ticket comes in, um, when a ticket comes in and, ah, OK, this is a problem in the system that we should uh, guard against it in the future, it should be easy to write a regression test, to integrate in our regression test suite so that we know this will not appear in the next upgrade, for example. Portability is that we have several systems. It's not just speed stain. We have other systems. We have systems for um, uh, the Meteo Suisse. We have other systems, non cray systems. So it was quite important that when we write a test, we don't want to rewrite it completely for a new system. We just want to the same file um, <laughs> to, to be able to use it with small adaptations uh, to another system. Speed and ease of use, that's important for our sysadmins. When they want to give the system back or diagnose a problem, it's important for them to, be, to, to quickly run a set of regression tests. That's what drove us to, to support synchronous execution of tests. And also uh, to have a, a, a reach, but also um, a, a simple command line interface and intuitive so that it can help them to diagnose problems. And robustness, that was also one thing we, we started. We want the framework to be uh, quite robust. So from line one of the code that we have written, uh, we had unit tests. Uh, unit tests of the code were not just something that we added later. So we, we followed the test-driven design, and actually now there is like a 60-40% code, 40% of the total code base are the unit tests. So it's well tested. Of course, it's not perfect. So uh, I'm going to list here some of the uh, key features. Uh, as I said, we have uh, we separate the system and programming environment configuration from the test logic. I'm going to go a bit quickly because um, uh, uh, there's also more important thing later on. Uh, we support cycling through programming environments and the system partitions. All this, uh, I'm going to show you how you define them. The tests are written in Python, and the advantage of that, but you don't have to learn um, 
I mean, to be a good Python programmer to do. It's simple tests are really very declarative. Just a class and some fields that you enter. You may uh, use some ifs if you want. Um, and that's very, I, I see it as an advantage because it's ve it really helps with the maintenance and then the more advanced you are, uh, you can really have some nice uh, patterns there in your test. Uh, we produce, uh, we, we support um, sanity and performance checking within this, um, within um, our uh, mini language, I would say. Uh, progress and results reports, we support uh, syslog and graylog for performance logging. The other good thing is that we have internal framework is designed as such with very clean internal APIs so that um, uh, functionality can be, not, can be added uh, without um, affecting other parts of the framework. Some other features, we support multiple workload manager backends um, and parallel launchers, uh, multiple environment modules backend, uh, backends, uh, build systems. We're not another easy build or spark, it's just sometimes you want to test your application that's with, it's done with CMake and uh, you just, or you, ha you write your own benchmark and you have a make file, just this is the purpose, it's nothing more uh, advanced than this. A synchronous execution of tests and we have a complete documentation with tutorials, references that, that we always try to keep up to date. So here is a bit of the architecture. So uh, it's a bit layered. Um, so on the top, you can see the uh, regression test API. It's where the writer of a regression test uh, actually talks to. Uh, and uh, this internally reframe uses some abstractions for system and environments. So the core of regression doesn't care about the exact system details. So there is uh, several backends that, that actually talk to the OS and they are uh, OS specific, uh, I mean system specific. <coughs> On the left hand is what we call the frame front end is when you run it and it actually drives the execution of the test, loads them uh, and runs them. I'm gonna show how this is. So first how we configure, this is, I, I, I got this quote from uh, uh, last EasyBuild user meeting where I had a presentation and one of people of the audience could uh, clone it and set it up on his laptop. So here is um, how a configuration looks like for, uh, it's, that's a real configuration from uh, one of our TDS systems. It's a, it's a Frankenstein system, so it's ha it has several partitions with different hardware. So we call the system old. Um, and here you specify, uh, if there is a pointer. Uh, okay, yeah, I found it. Uh, the module system that you're going to use, uh, this is uh, where you might have large files uh, that will be needed for resources from some tests if needed. And then you specify these partitions. These are just logical partitions, not necessarily partitions to the scheduler. So you say, I have my login loads, the scheduler there, uh, there is local, meaning that there's no scheduler. Uh, you define your programming environment. This is just a name. We, I'm just using the convention of Cray because we're so much used to it. Um, and um, the Mac job is to limit the concurrency so that reframe when you run it on that partition, you don't want it to spawn more than four jobs in this case. Uh, here is a, an AMD uh, with, uh, no, I, I mean, the name of partition is a bit wrong, but anyway, uh, with NVIDIA V100. So here is how you, you take the partition, you access to that with uh, passing this option to uh, your SLAM scheduler. These are the programming environment you need to test. And here is, there is a second section where you define your programming environments per system. So every, I mean, on old, the peers and GNU is defined uh, by loading those modules and uh, by setting those uh, to be your compiler and uh, your compilers. Uh, you can define PRG and GNU differently on different systems. And with this, you, if your test says that I'm going to use the GNU toolchain, uh, it doesn't have to uh, care uh, how this toolchain is uh, loaded on, on a system. Oh, sorry. So here is a test. Uh, perhaps it's, yeah, it doesn't, it's a bit small. But here is a full-fledged uh, test that actually runs a matrix vector CUDA kernel. Uh, test its sanity and um, uh, and that's test its performance. So I'm going to walk quickly through it. 
So here is a, actually the regression tests are specially annotated um, uh, classes. So you just annotate them with this uh, annotator simple test. Um, uh, and there is another one I'm gonna show later. And then you just, a bit declarative, you say, okay, um, my valid system that I'm gonna run to is Dane, the GPU partition. These are the programming environments that I can run on. So if these are in the valid si in the system that I'm trying to run, then I will run. Uh, here is uh, where this benchmark code resides. Uh, every test has a specific hierarchy uh, where it expects the code. I'm not gonna go to these details. Uh, how we're gonna build it is a single source file uh, and flags to pass, what are the executable options, extra modules to load, um, how uh, num GPUs per node to use. And then is this, uh, this is the, the sanity patterns to look at. So this is a, uh, an expression essentially that is uh, lazily executed. And you say, uh, okay, if you find, oh, um, it's like a grep in this case, but it can be quite more cl complex. Then we have what we call performance patterns, which is a dictionary where the keys are the, um, uh, the performance variables to, you want to look at. So your test might, uh, accept, uh, apart from execution time, might be printing also gigabytes per second, uh, gigaflux per second. So you can list them here and with an expression uh, on how you extract this information from, um, uh, from the output. Uh, is it standard output, is it another file, whatever. Um, and then is the reference. So here you have all your systems and say, okay, on the NGPU, this performance, uh, the, uh, the, this performance variable must have a value of 50 gigaflops plus minus 10%. And then you can also put special tags to your uh, test so that you can select them uh, apart from their name, you can also select them on another direction and so, so they can create groupings. Uh, how how um, Reframe runs the tests? So as soon as it loads the test and decides which test to load, then each test goes through a specific set of stages, what we call the regression test pipeline. So when the test is loaded, the neat method I've just shown before is, is executed and then there is a set of phases. Set of phases is every test goes through them. So the first phase is the setup method where the, your test is set up for the specific system partition and programming environment. And some directories are created. And uh, also uh, <coughs> um, an internal job descriptor in Reframe is also created. Then it's the build phase. This is optional for those tests that you need to build. Uh, then the run phase uh, where the, actually the test is submitted Sanity, sanity checking, performance checking, and cleanup. Now, there are two execution policies. One is the serial execution policy that executes each of the tests and each phase uh, in order. So the problem here is that you have large idling times when you're waiting the job to finish. Uh, so the synchronous execution policy just um, covers this gap by picking up the next test. That by doing so, uh, in, in order to do so, it Makes care, it takes care of the environment and everything to be set up correctly and restored for, um, uh, for every next tech, uh, <coughs> test it, uh, it runs. And then it enters, uh, as soon as it processes all the tests, it enters a busy loop at the end waiting for tests to finish and they can finish in any order and we'll pick them up. And actually this really um, speeds up things, especially if you have run only tests. We're planning to do the same for the build phase so that you can spawn build jobs also to uh, partitions. So as I said, you may skip some cases, some uh, stages. Um, and also the other important thing is that you can modify the behavior of the stages by overriding the corresponding methods. So you can do um, your, um, usually the setup method is the one that in 99% of the cases you, will, you, uh, you might need to override. Uh, because there you can do some uh, specifics based on your programming environment that you're going to run. And then the front end is also, of the reframe is also well structured. So it has, again, three phases. So first, you, uh, it searches uh, for tests in the directories that you specify, 
or uh, in a default one, then there is a, a selection phase uh, where you can, um, uh, we have several options of selecting uh, by uh, name, by programming environment, by the system, uh, by, uh, by tags, and all this you can use regular expression. So you can really um, easily select the test that you want to run. And then there is an action per to be performed on those tests, which is either listing or random. And the listing is quite useful. I always use it because I, it, it shows you what's going to be run, which tests are going to be run. So um, now a bit, a bit on how the environment is handled. So we're a Cray, uh, a Cray a, a, a system with Cray uh, system. And we don't rely on module pairs because this is a direct road to disaster. They said that they're going to fix it in some of the upcoming piece, but Anyway, this is the current situation. So, <laughs> so, um, so the reframe starts from the unmodified user environment. This is something that we wanted to, to um, at least for our system, was important because um, we, were, I mean, we're getting all sorts of crazy tickets, and um, if you don't start from the clean environment, um, the idea is to, to be able to reproduce the behavior start from a clean Cray environment, that's, that's the thing, not just clean environment, clean Cray environment. So the frame starts in the, in the current environment, and then for every test, it is, uh, before running each test, it restores the state of the environment at this point. So um, another thing is that we resolve automatically module conflicts. So in your test, you don't have to do a module load the previous programming environment, or module load the, this, this thing that conflicts. Uh, they will be detected from <coughs> free frame, and when it generates um, the actual uh, bat script, it will do the correct commands. So here is how uh, it's, uh, you can run it. So it's, um, so actually there you pass a, um, a path to the configuration file, if it's not the non-default, and here where you need to look for uh, regression tests and the minus R option is for running. So there are three basic directories that are used when running. Uh, the states directory, so uh, this is the directory where everything happens while the test is running. So all of its resources are copied in there and jobs are su submitted from this directory. So this is uh, like a sandbox. So if something fails, you can go into that directory and reproduce what the frame has done. Then we have the, what we call the output directory, which perhaps a better name would be archiving directory, uh, <coughs> which uh, at the end of its job, if it's successful, we just save some important files for later uh, um, uh, view, for, uh, to view later. And there is the, what we call the performance log directory, it's directory where performance logs for performance uh, tests go, and I'm gonna show you how uh, it looks like. Uh, then we generate uh, a summary report at the end with detailed failure information. So uh, here is, oh, okay, this is a bit mixed up, but anyway, uh, it's a bit nicer than this, the output. So anyway, the look and feel is a bit um, like um, Google test, so you have run, okay, and here I'm running the, the example I just showed, showed you before. Um, so you see that from that 50 lines or less, uh, uh, we are running for the same test with Craig, GNU, PGI, and then we have our result. Then now I, I've inserted, I, I've changed a bit the reference value just to um, uh, inject a failure in order to show you how it looks like. So then you get a report uh, where you can see um, uh, the system partition was running, which programming environment was failing, then you see your stage directory where you can go into and inspect your failure yourself and try to reproduce uh, manually what was happening. Uh, what was the job type? It was a bad job. Here you have the job ID in case you want to correlate with other things happening in the system. Uh, the failing uh, phase, uh, it's the performance phase in this pipeline I've shown you, and here is a message. So as I said, um, so, it's, it's, its test is executed from a separate state directory. This is the format. And inside there, you can find actual build scripts. So um, also, um, Reframe generates some build scripts. Uh, and the idea behind that is that later on, we want to be able to 
uh, just as batch those build scripts in order to uh, do compilation remotely. Uh, and uh, the actual job script and where you can go in there, just submit it yourself. It should be self-contained and then you can reproduce the error. Play a bit with the with, uh, with script and then transfer those changes to uh, your test. So uh, performance logging, so uh, there is, um, uh, Trim has a prefix directory which is uh, the parent of, by default is the parent of stage, output and uh, the rest. In there, there is uh, what we call the perf logs, where uh, you have um, a log file per, um, per test. And this is appended every time you run this performance test. And it's very, it's, it's, its format is completely configurable, but by default is very well structured so that it is, it, it is easily parsable. And here you see a timestamp, the version of every frame that has run it, which was a test, which system, uh, which programming environment, job ID, the performance, the reference value. And then you can use that to plot and uh, to keep it for historical data, feed it in a database. But you can also use the, you can also feed those logs directly to syslog or Greylog. So for example, in our case, we're sending them directly to a Greylog server that we have, and then we can go and do uh, from Grafana plots of performance uh, over time. So another, this is a, a new option we've added this year, what we call the performance report. So when you have, uh, you want to run um, performance benchmarks or performance tests, and you don't want just to go and every time pick into um, the, uh, uh, the performance log, you pass this option and we'll uh, show you here uh, the exact measured performance of this test. Now uh, here uh, for correlation, I have how the test looks like. So here is, is, is this test actually what it does. It's part of the test. So uh, it, it computes the kernel, the latency of launching a CUDA kernel um, either synchronously or asynchronously. So uh, here we extract, so, and does that for all the GPUs of the node. So here we, we, we say extract this pattern, convert it to float, and get the max out of it, and this is what your latency is for the test, test. And here is you have for the two variants of the test, uh, you have on DOM, the latency should be like that. Uh, if it's the sync kernel, if it's the sync, it should be like that. And actually, actually the sys reference just, um, it, it's not a reframe variable, it's just a custom variable I've added. And uh, what is a reframe variable is this reference that I showed you also before. And yeah, based on the variant of the test, uh, use the correct reference. So you can do these tricks because you're writing in a real programming language. Uh, another cool feature is the flexible test. This is useful for diagnostics. So the idea is when you set num task equals zero in your test or in a negative number, uh, then uh, this will be interpreted that this test can, uh, uh, w will be submitted uh, to all the available nodes of the partition you are submitted. Um, so there are three modes of execution, what is called idle. So it will just use up all the idle nodes of that partition if you have such a test. This is the default mode. Uh, or um, uh, if you use the uh, flex alloc task equals all, this will use up all every single node on your partition. This is to use like the sanity checks uh, in all your cluster. Uh, or you can just specify, now run it with just two tasks or four tasks or whatever. And the cool thing about it is that you can uh, also combine it with other um, constraints. Like uh, I want all the tasks that they are in this reservation and we'll just test all the nodes that they are in this reservation. The same for node list. If you, have, if you want to verify that some nodes are perhaps in bad condition and want to run a benchmark on them, uh, you can say, okay, now, um, do um, all the, I want all the nodes that they are in this node list. Now, the thing is that this is only valid for this learn backend. If somebody w knows how to do it in other backends, is welcome to uh, contribute. Uh, so, how we use Reframe at CSCS? Uh, we have several tests, and we are expanding our test suite. Uh, <coughs> we have in total 542 different tests. Most of them are for Daint, uh, which is our main system. Then CAS is the system from uh, Meteor Suisse. 
uh, Noni is another small, it's going to be decommissioned. Uh, it's a smaller system for uh, some private customers. Um, now we have generally three categories of tests uh, that we market them. With DAG, we have what we call production tests. This is a big suite uh, that comprises applications, libraries, uh, programming environments, um, profiling tools, debuggers, micro benchmarks, and we check sanity and performance depending on the test. And we run this nightly by Jenkins. And we have then maintenance test, which is a much smaller suite that uh, the uh, op operation guys before and after each maintenance session they run a reframe to verify uh, the system status before giving it, announcing to the user. And then we have what we call diagnostics or, and benchmarks, um, uh, which are usually flexible tests in the sense that you want them like, uh, I want to run GPU burn on a set of nodes, so you just uh, use the test. You don't want to do that on the full cluster without a permission higher up because it will, the electricity bill will be crazy. So here is how our setup looks like for the, the Jenkins. So we have, uh, we control that through uh, the web interface from Jenkins. So there is the Jenkins VM that can talk to um, the login nodes through SSH. This is all behind our VPN, so this is not publicly accessible. And then uh, from here we use the Jenkins pipelines uh, to uh, actually uh, launch um, uh, reframe on the on the systems no so here is a, an example of our one of our production systems this is a successful run how it looks like and here is a, a failure um, where you can go and uh, click from the Jenkins interface and you have the output of reframe with all the information so uh, I, I have a couple of slides of how you can use the frame with a, a CI service. Um, I have prepared those for um, our, um, our colleagues at Zurich, which are mostly um, in developing scientific software and libraries. So, um, so I, I will start with a couple of disclaimers. So the frame is not a unit test framework. So it does not replace, a, if you're writing your code, you have to write your unit test. It's a different thing. It's, it is also, it does not replace CI CD framework. It's not another Jenkins and it's not its purpose to be or another GitLab. What it is, it's what it helps with integration, function and performance test on HPC systems and it gives you a uniform way on doing that across systems so that you don't have um, to maintain different sets for Dane, different sets for uh, uh, for another system, different sets for another system. <coughs> so here, uh, this is a very brief introduction on what we offer to our users as CI service. It's based on Jenkins uh, and allows them to run tests on, um, on our systems, uh, actually uh, CI of their code. So when they do a pull request, there is uh, a Jenkins VM uh, that can only as back to our compute nodes and uh, there usually they will have to do, write a bad script and to do run their tests or their functional tests. So the idea is that with Reframe you can completely abstract this thing of writing a whole bad script. Um, and the same you can do also with Travis. Um, and I'm gonna show you just for our CI service example here. So here is a test I have written for um, a code that we have, it's called Arbor, is a, a library for um, neuromorphic, okay, yeah, I am fine, I'm finishing. Um, for uh, neuroscience and neuro, um, it's simulating the brain. So uh, this is, this code runs, it has several versions, runs on GPUs, runs without GPUs, runs with MPI, without MPI, uh, and um, it can, um, it can emit different, uh, based on the microarchitecture, it can emit different SIMD instructions at the back end. So I wanted to write a test to test all these aspects and I wanted to do this, to use the same test for my laptop and for uh, Pete's date. So here I started with a base, so this base test. The valid systems are the GPU partition of Dane, the multi-core partition of Dane and my laptop. Valid programming environments, it was GNU. I have put initially Intel but I discovered the bug before I first done this presentation. And I told the guys uh, there is a bug with Intel, so I didn't put the Intel here. 
uh, um, with Intel compiler in their code, not with Intel compiler itself. But, uh, and Clang is on my laptop. So uh, here is where the source is. So this, this test resides in a, dire in a subdirectory inside the source tree of that project. So that's why you see uh, these pre sources there. Is where are the sources of this project are. Now this is the executable, which is going to be the unit tests of this framework. Uh, if you're on Daint, specify these variables. Use also these modules. Uh, this should have been a bit indented if it's, you're on Daint. Um, then look for past in the standard output. I'm just keeping it simple. I could, I could have added more things and add more functional tests. So here is oh, um, how to build. So they use CMake and the config option of what to pass. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's a different purpose uh, as of easy build. It's not to install the software, it's just to compile it and run it. Uh, and then this is the base test, that tests the base functionality. Now, I want to do uh, the MPI version and actually don't have to rewrite everything. And that's the beauty of it. Now I'm using, since I'm writing full-fledged Python, I'm using just inheritance. And I'm just ch uh, um, changing here that the MPI test is only meaningful for the GPU and MC partition for Dane. It's not for my laptop. And of course, just use GNU because there is no clang there. But I could even put the peer gen of clang here. It, it wouldn't just be tested. Uh, and also add these config options to, to enable MPI. Then I don't have to redefine everything, write a new bus script to uh, do the whole compilation. And then I want to test a third kind, which is um, to test the SIMD backends of that code. So there I use this um, nice decorator that's called parameterized test that actually you can pass parameters to your test. So your test, your test constructor might get um, a parameter. And actually this is like a factory. So it will generate uh, three tests out of just this template. And in that case, I say, um, if you are on Haswell, then your valid system is the GPU. If you're building for Haswell, just the, this test is only for GPU. If you're building for Broadwell, it's for the multi-core nodes of Daint plus my laptop. And if you use the native, just the auto-discovery thing, just use it on my laptop because uh, this wouldn't work on Daint because on Daint you're cross-compiling. So in uh, about 60 lines of code, I have one, two, three, four, five tests that, uh, that are very easily maintainable. If suddenly I, I just change uh, a basic option uh, of how it is built, then I can just go uh, here and change something here, and uh, the test will be still valid. So if I change a configuration parameter of the system, <coughs> Again, I can still write. If I change the name of a partition where I submit, or if I want to test it on another system, most probably I will just have to adjust um, uh, here the valid system, add another entry, or set another environment variable. Things, small things like that. So here is uh, a, a demo pull request I've done. So on my fork of that project, I did a pull request, and this was, has triggered the uh, the CI of uh, CSCS, and the CI of CSCS has then run the reframe tests, which is here the reframe output that I've shown you before. So uh, now changing topic and moving to what we're actually we're working on um, right now. So we want to support test dependencies. It's often the case that we come up um, that uh, you have something, a test that is a prerequisite, like a build test, and then you, ha you want to do uh, like a scaling test of something that you develop. So you don't, currently what is going to happen is either you have to recompile every time in your test, or you have to invoke reframe twice. Once to do um, the build and somehow install, or invoke easy build for perhaps to do the installation and then do uh, something, um, uh, a scaling test, but actually when you're doing development, this is uh, not so easy. So we're working on, and it's quite in an advanced um, uh, uh, stage, 
uh, on supporting dependence. So the idea is, for example, you have a test that you, uh, it takes too long to complete and you don't want to rerun it. And then inside, here I have a scaling test for uh, one to one K nodes. And uh, I'm saying, okay, this depends on this one. And uh, in the setup method, uh, you're gonna say, okay, get the dependency. Because what we're gonna do is that before running, entering the pipeline, a test, it will make sure the framework, uh, the frame that all of its dependencies have been resolved, have, have been finished. So then here in the setup method, you will be able to get um, uh, my dependent, uh, which is my build up test. And this will actually return you the actual instance that was actually run by a reframe. So then you can access all the information of the test of reframe. So then you can say, okay, you're executable. In this test will be um, uh, reside in the stage directory of that uh, target test. It's that one, and here is how you run it. And uh, we are um, actually the implementation is at the level where we have we're building the dependency graph, and uh, we will soon have support at least for the serial execution. Another thing we're looking into is uh, to have a seamless container support. Currently, you can still run containers uh, from, uh, uh, from within the reframe, but you have to be more explicit. So you have to say shifter run or singularity run in your executable. And you have to pass the option. The, the option. So it won't abstract a bit this away. So we want to hear that you can specify like your container platform that you are go going to run, or it could be something generic, OCI, or uh, in the sense that you can run it from your laptop and it will detect that you have Docker, for example. You go to another system, it has singularity, and use it with singularity or with another um, uh, thing. <coughs> then some basic options, and then depending on the type of the platform, you can, uh, we might have more specific, if needed, uh, options. And then also the commands that you're gonna run uh, in order to avoid this ugly ampersand ampersand uh, thing that you have the very big line. So this is what we're actually working on. So who's using or experimenting with the frame? We're not alone. Uh, so uh, so I, uh, apart from us, um, CSES and Meteor Suisse, NERSC, I know they're using it for um, testing um, uh, as a sanity checking tool afterwards. Uh, uh, after main or uh, maintenances, they they told me that they want to move their benchmarks into the frame. Uh, I talked with the Surfsara guys; they're uh, having tests uh, already running in production. They want to uh, uh, do benchmarks. Uh, EPC has expressed interest; they want to do I/O benchmarks with the frame. Chineka, we we're talking with Simona before; they're, he's trying it. Pose and Niwa, they uh, have it in production. Uh, Ohio Supercomputing Center again. Um, ASML, uh, a company, they, actually these guys, they, they wanted to run it on their system with PBS, so they uh, contributed back the first version of the PBS scheduler, and now they're using it. And there are people that they're uh, actually trying it out. So we're, it's getting some momentum. So um, finalizing, um, Reframe is, is a powerful tool that allows you to, to that enables you to continuously test HPC in a sustainable system in a sustainable uh, way. Uh, and uh, as I showed you, you write your tests in a high level uh, Python and high level fully fledged programming language that really gives you um, uh, advantages in maintainability of your tests. Um, and we are focusing a lot in portability of tests across different uh, tests. And the proof of this is that several centers they're getting our tests and they're doing small adaptations to the tests and then they just have them running on their uh, own systems. Uh, we provide reports um, and uh, we have also functionality test multiple nodes and um, you can follow the dependency, the, the development on GitHub. Uh, we have a mailing list, we have a Slack channel and yeah, the documentation. Uh, yeah, here I should have updated, but actually this will redirect you to the new pages. So that's it. Um, I'm happy to get questions. Yes. So did, did someone from Livermore contact you? Yeah, Brian. Oh. Brian Friesen. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're in contact with him, yeah.
do you do you force this on system vendors as well so that they have to run reframe for a tender? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking with with Cray. I mean, uh, they wanted to. We have presented to them, but generally they're a bit conservative in their uh, programming environment. I know now they're kind of trying to to change, but um, they, they. I mean, we are in contact. So, <laughs> but yeah, it, I, I would I would guess it would improve a lot because we could also we're we're facing when we're doing upgrades with Cray. It's really painful. Yeah. So for the tests where you're using programming environments, how much provenance do you actually store about that stuff? Because like if you just load the prog in new environment, right? Like you don't know what version of the PE that was or you know maybe You can you Yeah, good question. That. Yeah. So what what you have in in your test what you call peer gen GNU is just a symbolic name. Yeah. So you can define as many environments specific that you want. Uh, in your config file, and then um, you can say or or, or or pin versions, mm -hmm. and say in the config. Uh, let me. I should go. Uh, so here, so here, for example, you could um, you could name this as you like, and here you could have specific versions. And then you can have multiple of those. It's, it's, yeah, this is still manual. Uh, what about the PE version itself? The PE version? The, like the, the actual programming environment version. Because Cray versions that, and it's a little weird. Um, like yeah, I, yeah, for that, actually, for the PE specific things, we're just, we want to test what Cray provides. Mm -hmm. And then for all our software stack, we have, Easy build, which is pinned versions. So, um, so here we just use what is the default. So, PRG and GNU. And when we do an, an upgrade in the TDS system, we uh, we put the new P version, and then we just run all our regression suite, which will use again PRG and GNU and see what is failing. Okay. What really matters here is only the current system. You don't really care about producing a test on something you ran a year ago. Because well, it's, it's not really so right. So NERSC maintains like three versions of the PE in their environment, right? So you do actually, the current system is ill-defined. Yeah, but in, in that case, you could you could have like your three versions in your config and in, in, in your test where you say valid programming environments. No, uh, let's say let's say the example. So assume that we had three versions here. So here you would say, uh, I'm gonna set the P version one, P version two, P version three that you define here, and then in your test, uh, when you're running on the X system, uh, you can say that I want this hello world or this type of test to uh, to be run on to, to to be valid for all the versions of the P. Now, okay, there might be a problem how you switch the P's. That's, I don't know how, how NERSC is doing that, but I, I would be interesting to see. Yeah, what, what are you doing instead of loading per, I guess I didn't think, are you actually just unloading things or finding? Yeah, things? we're unloading yeah. things, so we're, so actually we're, we're looking into, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're looking into the module file, either L mode or, um, or T mode, and we're trying to figure out heuristically. I don't know, it's the conflicts, and you unload the conflicts, and then you load your stuff. So far, it has worked, but I guess there will be cases that. We have like some library code that they do to be consolidated. We've had like three iterations of this for working on different trace systems, and nothing seems to be consistent. Yeah, let's, let's talk about it again. I have a question about Have you considered adding like? Tags or features of your partition, so you can you're done in the test. Because so all the tests that you've uh, shown all have like fixed uh, partition or something, right? So all depend on the individual. What if I install a new machine tomorrow? I don't want to change all my tests to run on the new system. I just want to say, okay, this test depends on the individual. 
running on all my systems that are completely operating. Yeah. No, currently you have to to put uh, what you can. What you can do is uh, you prepare your configuration and then you get your test that is GPU test. Uh, and then you, you can, from the command line, you can instruct, reframe, you can pass minus minus system, your new target system. And then you can uh, pass the option skips, skip system check. So that even if you have in your test the GPU, it will not just do the check there and it will not skip it. So this is a quick way of, uh, uh, it's not a permanent way, but it's a quick way of uh, quickly seeing, okay, is this, this GPU uh, test working on my new system? But then uh, what we usually do, we also change the test to have the new system as officially supported somehow. More questions? Okay, so we have the, uh, the coffee break already. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you.